Mr. Vice Chancellor. It is my honor to present to you Mitsumi Takahashi, journalist, broadcaster, engaged Montrealer, and distinguished alumna of this university. Person Personality reconnue de monde journalistique montréalaise depuis une trentaine d'années, Madame Takahashi est la présentatrice du journal télévisé CTV Montreal News depuis 1986. This is a remarkable achievement in a highly competitive profession. CTV Montreal now reaches 1.4 million viewers weekly, making Ms. Takahashi one of the most visible, recognizable, and trusted Montrealers. Although her undergraduate degree is in psychology, Ms. Takahashi was clearly destined to make her mark in journalism. Her interest in media began right here at Concordia as a newsreader on Radio Sir George. Pendant ses études à Concordia, Madame Takahashi a été journaliste au journal étudiant Georgian et a réalisé nombre d'interviews dans le cadre d'une série présentée sur CUTV la chaîne étudiante de l'université. Following a brief career in Montreal radio, Ms. Takahashi arrived at CFCF-TV, now CTV Montreal, as a news reporter. After only four years, her investigative acumen and professional style won her a place at the anchor desk, an impressive achievement. But she has also made an impression outside the journalistic realm. A titre bénévole, Madame Takahashi co-préside avec une autre Montréalaise bien connue, Jean Beliveau, la campagne Les Meilleurs Soins pour la Vie, du nouveau Centre Universitaire de Santé McGill. Mr. Vice Chancellor, for her professional achievements, her commitment to her community, and her service to this university, on behalf of Senate and the Board of Governors, it is my privilege and honor to present to you Mitsumi Takahashi so that you may confer upon her the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. I ask Dr. Mitsumi Takahashi to give us an evening address. Good evening, bonsoir. Monsieur le Président du Conseil d'administration, Monsieur le Recteur, invité d'honneur, cher diplômé, my husband, my friends, and my contingent here from CTV News Montreal, who are here somewhere, I think. You guys here? Okay. And of course, Wayne. <laughs> audio, you got audio? Batteries are working? Good, good. It is hard for me to believe I'm actually here, standing on the stage of Place des Arts, being presented with such an honor. 
And I thank Concordia University for this and for so many other things the university has given me in my life. My only regret is that my parents aren't here to see this. Both my parents were academics, they were mathematicians, and they never really got quite what I did for a living. Just to give you an example of what they were like, the only time I saw my father really excited was about 30 years ago. He'd seen a woman get hit by a bus at the corner of St. Catherine Street in Atwater. When he got home, all he kept saying was how amazing it was because she'd made this perfect parabolic arc right across the intersection. <laughs> so you might understand that for them, any work that calls for a lot of makeup and good hair is not really work worth doing. So they would have been delighted, they would have been puzzled, but they would have been delighted that I'm receiving this honor tonight. So I've spent weeks agonizing over what I was gonna to say tonight, hoping to come up with something very deeply profound, so I couldn't. So I decided to tell you some stories about people I've come across in one way or another who've helped me get to where I am today. Stories that I've never told before in such a large public forum. So that gasp that you might have heard is from my news director, who is up there having heart palpitations. Jed, it's okay, I won't mention any names. Um, so there I was, my second year at Concordia, I was majoring in psychology, didn't have a clue what to do with my life. So I enrolled in a class just because it happened to be later in the day and I didn't want to have to get up early in the morning. I became friends with someone who worked at the university radio station, CRSG. So my girlfriend and I went to visit. The station manager of CRSG invited us to hang around, maybe read the news every once in a while. I recall him telling the other people at the station, quote, We'll let the broad sit out front. They'll look good when the record reps come to visit. <laughs> and so a career was born. And that girlfriend, by the way, um, is now a foreign correspondent. She works here out of Montreal. I managed to talk myself into a real job in radio. I um, just happened to call a radio station because I figured, well, why not? And it turned out they were looking for a copywriter. I first went on the air as Marilee Taylor. That was a name given to me by a station manager who said Mitsumi Takahashi just sounded too strange. And uh, that only lasted a few months because everyone on the air kept forgetting what my name was supposed to be because I never answered to anything other than Mitsumi and it turned into a huge joke and they finally let me change it back. My uh, first news director was nicknamed Boom Boom and uh, we called him that because he was the only man we knew who'd taken himself hostage twice. I had another news director who used to change down to his underwear in the news booth, all the while talking like Kermit the Frog. And um, <laughs> I know and it's true, isn't that sad? Um, and he's the one who actually tries to take credit now for teaching me how to read the news. Um, I worked the overnight shift. I had a colleague who every once in a while at around three o'clock in the morning, when I'd be writing my news copy, he'd lie on the floor next to my desk and he'd twitch. And I'd ask him what he was doing, and he'd say he was pretending to be bacon frying. <laughs> and um, he, by the way, still works here as a journalist in Montreal. <laughs> um, another time, also at around three o'clock in the morning, I went into master control to get some news tapes, and I found the overnight operator involved in what can only be described as a not very imaginative but extremely intimate act with a young woman. So I got the tapes, I said, excuse me, I got the tapes, I left. About half an hour later, I ran into this young woman in the washroom and she gave me this huge smile and she looked at me and she said, so, how did you get your job here? <laughs> so. Anyways, I would like to say, by the way, that that is not a recommended way of trying to seek employment <laughs> anyway. My radio career ended very abruptly after I received a visit at the station from a gay friend of mine. My news director, as it turned out, was extremely homophobic. So my friend, so if you could picture this, six foot two, wearing a pink feather boa, and he called himself Mona. He took one look at my news director, turned to me and screamed, oh, Mitz, he's gorgeous. 
I was fired three days later. And uh, that very homophobic news director, wherever he is today, I thank him for that. So what it comes down to is this. A career doesn't necessarily have to come of a carefully laid out plan. Often, it's just a matter of reacting calmly to unreasonable people in situations and looking for an opportunity, even when life seems very bleak, like getting fired because of a visit from a gay guy named Mona wearing a pink feather boa. Because for all the strange news directors I've had, I've also had some very good ones. And one of them hired me to be a TV reporter, even though I had no TV experience. He told me he didn't care why I had been fired. He said he just trusted his instincts and didn't really care what other people thought. So these days, newsrooms, not quite as crazy, but still populated by characters who are a little offbeat, worked with an anchor man who would very earnestly try to explain to me during commercial breaks how he was being attacked by inanimate objects. You know who you are. And we also have a female lineup editor whose outlook on life is so bleak, we call her Fifty Shades of Black. <laughs> so we are journalists, we are cynics. We have little respect for authority. Our humor is warped at best. But seriously, and if you would allow me to be a little pretentious about it right now, journalism at its best is the search for the truth. And it's not easy these days when the truth can be a little difficult to take. The answer, though, you know, is not to, not to opt out. You know, people in authority have let us down. Politicians, corporate religious leaders, NHL referees. These days, even some former journalists. And of course, thanks to these former journalists, I figure it'll be a while before any other journalist gets appointed to the Senate. Um, but anyway. <laughs> you know, life isn't fair. Life isn't fair, and often it seems like the wrong people win. But in my experience, the good guys do come out ahead in the long run. And don't be afraid to fail. We can't succeed without risking failure. I remember when former Ontario Premier David Peterson suffered a crushing defeat in an election, and his party was all but wiped out. And he was asked by a reporter, are you ashamed? And he said, there's never any shame in getting knocked down. The shame is when you don't get back up again. So I wish I could say there would be major dramatic events in my life, something extraordinary, something life-changing, but then most of us don't have lives like that. Most of us will never be called on to make that dramatic, headline-making act of heroism. Instead, most of us are going to be tested and judged by the small things that we do, little decisions we make every day. How do we treat those weaker than us? Are we willing to stand alone on a principle? It's about doing the right thing, even when it's not popular. As a friend of mine once said, we're all born with a full set of integrity points, and what we lose along the way, we never get back. You are now graduates of Concordia University, and you've, you've earned it, yes. But those diplomas you will now hold are a privilege that comes with a responsibility. It's a responsibility to make a contribution, to do something, whether it's big or small, to make the world around you a better place for you having lived in it. It's a cliche, I know, but you are the future. You are my future. And as I get older, and I figure I'm getting older because the most commonly asked question I get these days is, so how old are you anyway, and who's your plastic surgeon? <laughs> But uh, regardless of my age, and I am not saying, and I do not, by the way, have a plastic surgeon, um, I and everybody in my generation will be depending on you to take over in the years to come, and I like to think that we will be in good hands. So what will you do with that? Will you help cure our diseases? Will you form governments to keep their promises? Or will you take kickbacks, look out for yourself and only yourself, and turn your back on people who might need your help? Will you build roads and sidewalks that don't fall apart without taking that extra 3%? <laughs> Will you... Uh... <laughs> Will you tell the truth when at times it seems so much simpler not to? Tomorrow, you begin your new life as university graduates. It's all up to you now. And at the end of the day, we all have to decide what success and a good life means for us, whether it's money or a fancy title. 
Maybe it's just a friend who can put together a collection of the best rock driving songs, right, Steph? Or who knows the value of a good bottle of Brunello. Ralph Waldo Emerson sums it up for me. He said this, to laugh much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of animals, to earn the appreciation of honest critics, and to endure the betrayal of false friends to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better by a healthy child or a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you lived, that is to have succeeded. Thank you. I'm so glad we don't have to call you Mary Lee Taylor. <laughs> Dr. Mitsumi Takahashi, wonderful address.